Okay, hello. So we're going to start chapter seven, but I decided we're going to do something a little different in this chapter because I think many of you are using this for school and you probably have to eventually write an essay about this or some kind of character analysis or a theme essay. Um, or maybe you have to have a discussion in a group or in class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it as if I would read it to my students in my classroom. So I might stop and explain something or I might point out some good quotes that you could use in an essay or something that you could actually talk about in a discussion. So if you like this format, maybe just send me a message in the, in the comments. That way I can continue doing them this way. If you don't like it, then also let me know. But please, please be polite, though, when you do that. So here we go, Chapter 7. Now Jonas's group had taken a place in the auditorium, trading with the new eleven so that they sat in the very front, immediately before the stage. They were arranged by their original numbers, the numbers they had been given at birth. The numbers were rarely used after the naming, but each child knew his number, of course. Sometimes parents use them in irritation at a child's misbehavior, indicating that mischief made one unworthy of a name. Jonas always chuckled when he heard a parent, exasperated, call sharply to a whining toddler, That's enough, 23! Jonas was 19. He had been the 19th newborn child his year. It had meant that his naming, he had been already standing and bright-eyed soon to walk and talk. It had given him a slight advantage the first year or two, a little more maturity than many of his groupmates who had been born in the later months of that year. But it evened out, as it always did, by three. After three, the children progressed at much the same level, though by their first number one, by their first number, one could always tell was a few months older than the other ones in the group. Technically, Jonas's full number was 1119, since there were other 19s, of course, in each age group. And today, now that the 11s had been advanced this morning, there were now two 1119s. At the midday break, he had exchanged smiles with the new one, a shy female named Harriet. But the duplication was only for a few hours. Very soon, he would not be 11, but a 12, and age would no longer matter. He would be an adult, like his parents, though a new one and untrained still. Asher was four and sat now in the row ahead of Jan Jonas. He would receive his assignment fourth. Fiona, 18, was on his left, and on his other side, at 20, a male named Pierre, who Jonas didn't like very much. Pierre was very serious, not much fun, and a worrier, and at tattletale, too. Have you checked the rules, Jonas? Pierre was always whispering solemnly. I'm not sure that's within the rules. Usually it was some foolish thing that no one cared about. Opening his tunic as if if it was a day with a breeze, taking a brief try on a friend's bicycle, just to experience the, difference, the different feel of it. The initial speech at the Ceremony of Twelve was made by the chief elder, the leader of the community who was elected every ten years. The speech was much the same each year, recollections of the time of childhood and the period of preparation, the coming responsibilities of adult life, the profound importance of assignment, the seriousness of training to come. Then the chief elder moved ahead in her speech. This is the time, she began looking directly at them, when we acknowledge differences. You elevens have spent all your years till now learning to fit in, to standardize your behavior, to curb any impulse that might set you apart from the group. But today we honor your differences. They have determined your futures. She began to describe this year's group and its variety of personalities, though she singled no one out by name. She mentioned that there was one who had singular skills, no, that was, sorry, she mentioned that there was one who had singular skills at caretaking, another who loved new children, one who was unusual scientific aptitude, and a fourth for whom physical labor was an obvious pleasure. Jonas shifted in his seat trying to recognize, oops, sorry, these pages are sticking together here, okay, each reference as one of his groupmates. The caretaking skills were no doubt those of Fiona. On his left, he remembered noticing the tenderness with which she had bathed the old. Probably the one with scientific aptitude was Benjamin, the male who had devised new, important equipment for the re rehabilitation center. He heard nothing that he recognized as himself, Jonas. Finally, the chief elder paid tribute to the hard work of her committee, which had performed the observations meticulously all year. The committee of elders stood and was acknowledged by applause. Jonas noticed Asher yawned slightly, covering his mouth politely with his hand. Then, at last, the chief elder called number one to the stage, and the assignments began. Each announcement was lengthy, accompanied by a speech directed at the new twelve. Jonas tried to pay attention as one, smiling happily, received her assignment as Fitch, Hatch, as Fitch Hashery as attendant, along with the words of praise for her child had spent during many volunteer hours there, and her obvious interest in the important process of providing nourishment for the community. Number one, her name was Madeline returned finally amidst applause to her seat, wearing the new badge that designated her fish hatchery attendant. Jonas 
was certainly glad that that assignment was taken. He wouldn't have wanted it, but he gave Madeline a smile of congratulations. When, too, a female named Inger received her assignment as birth mother, Jonas remembered that his mother had called it a job without honor, but he thought that the committee had chosen well. Inger was a nice girl, though somewhat lazy, and her body was strong. She would enjoy the three years of being pampered that would follow her brief training. She would give birth easily and well, and the task of laborer that would follow would use her strength, keep her healthy, and impose self-discipline. Inger was smiling when she resume, resumed her seat. Birth mother was an important job, if lacking in prestige. Jonas noticed that Asher looked nervous. He kept thinking, turning his head and glancing back at Jonas until the group leader had to give him a silent chastisement, a motion to sit still and face forward. Three, Isaac, was given an assignment as instructor of sixes, which obviously pleased him and was well-deserved. Now there were three assignments gone, none of them ones that Jonas had, would have liked. Not that he would have been birth mother anyway, he realized with amusement. He tried to sort through the list in his mind, the possible assignments that remained. But there were so many he gave up. And anyway, now it was Asher's turn. He paid strict attention as his friend went to the stage and stood self-consciously behind, beside the chief elder. All of us in the community know and enjoy Asher, the chief elder began. Asher grinned and scratched one leg with the other foot. The audience chuckled softly. When the committee began to consider Asher's assignment, she went on, there were some possibilities that were immediately discarded, some that would clearly not have been right for Asher. For example, she said, smiling, we did not consider for an instant designating Asher as instructor of threes. The audience howled with laughter. Asher laughed too, looking sheepish but, sheepish but pleased at the special attention. The instructors of threes were in charge of the acquisition of correct language. In fact, the chief elder continued chuckling a little himself, herself. We even gave it a little thought to some retroactive character. Sorry, we even gave little thought to some retroactive chastisements for the one who had been Asher's instructor of three so long ago. At the meeting where Asher was discussed, we retold many of the stories that we all remembered from his days of language acquisition. Especially, she said, chuckling, the difference between snack and smack. Remember, Asher? Asher nodded ruefully, and the audience laughed out loud. Jonas did, too. He remembered, though he had not, he had only been three at the time himself. The punishment used for small children was a regulated system of smacks with a discipline wand, a thin, flexible weapon that stung painfully when it was wielded. The child care specialists were trained very carefully in the discipline methods, a quick smack across the hand for a bit, minor, a bit of minor misbehavior, three sharper smacks on the bare legs for a second offense. Poor Asher, who always talked too fast and mixed up words, even as a toddler. As a three eager for his juice and crackers at snack time, he one day said, smack, instead of snack, and he stood waiting in line for the morning treat. Jonas remembered it clearly. He could still see little Asher wiggling with impatience in the line. He remembered the cheerful voice call out, I want my smack! The other, the other threes, including Jonas, had laughed nervously. Snack, they corrected. You meant snack, Asher. But the mistake had been made. Any and precision of language was one of the most important tasks of small children. Asher had asked for a smack. The discipline wand in the hand of the child care worker whistled as it came down across Asher's hands. Asher whimpered, cringed, and corrected himself instantly. Snack, he whispered. But the next morning he had done it again, and again the following week. He couldn't seem to stop, though for each lapse the discipline wand came again, escalating to a series of painful lashes that left marks on Asher's legs. Eventually, for a period of time, Asher just stopped talking altogether when he was three. For a while, the chief elder said, relating a story, we had a silent Asher, but he learned. She turned to him with a smile. When he began to talk again, it was great with greater precision, and now his lapses are very few. His corrections and apologies are very prompt, and his good humor is unfailing. The audience murmured in agreement. Asher's cheerful disposition was well known throughout the community. Asher, she lifted her voice to make the official announcement, we have given you the assignment of Assistant Director of Recreation. She clipped on his new badge as he stood beside her beaming. Then he turned and left the stage as the audience cheered. When he was taken a seat again, the chief elder looked down at him and said the words that she had said now four times and would say to each new twelve. Somehow, she gave it special meaning for each of them. Asher, she said, thank you for your childhood. Now, that would be a very important quote at some point if you're talking about the theme of of the community and how you know people are assigned and things so it's really important to notice the difference between the childhood and adults so that could be a really good point to put maybe a, a sticky note or write something in your notebook that this could be an important part of the book it also shows too that 
they are kind of singling out Asher, which in the community is rarely done, so that was kind of an interesting part. We continue. The assignments continued, and Jonas watched and listened, relieved now by the wonderful assignments his best friend had been given, but he was more and more apprehensive at his own, as his own approached. Now for new to, the new twelves in a row ahead had all received their badges. They were fingering them as they sat, and Jonas knew that each one was thinking about the training that lay ahead. For some, one studious male had been selected as doctor, a female as engineer, another for law and justice. It would be years of hard work and study. Others, like laborers and birth mothers, would have a shorter training period. Eighteen, Fiona, on his left, we call, was called. Jonas knew she must be nervous, but Fiona was a calm female. She had been sitting quietly, serenely, throughout the ceremony. Even the applause, though enthusiastic, seemed serene when Fiona was given the important assignment of caretaker of the old. It was perfect for such a sensitive, gentle girl, and her smile was satisfied and pleased when she took her seat beside him again. Jonas was prepared to walk to the stage when the applause ended and the chief elder picked up the next folder and looked down at the group to call forward the next new twelve. He was calm now that his turn had come. He took a deep breath, smoothed his hair with his hand. Twenty, he heard her voice clearly say. Pierre. She skipped me, Jonas thought, stunned. Had he heard wrong? No. There was suddenly a hush in the crowd, and he knew that the entire community realized that the chief elder had moved from 18 to 20, leaving a gap. On his right, Pierre, with a startled look, rose from his seat and moved to the stage. A mistake? She made a mistake? But Jonas knew, even as he had thought the thought, that she hadn't. The chief elder did not make mistakes, not at the ceremony of twelve. He felt dizzy. He couldn't focus his attention. He didn't hear what assignment Pierre received and was only dimly aware of the applause as the boy returned wearing his new badge. Then, twenty-one. Twenty-two. The numbers continued in order, and Jonas sat, dazed, as they moved into the thirties, and then the forties, nearing the end. Each time, at each announcement, his heart jumped for a moment, and he thought wild thoughts. Perhaps now she would call his name. Could he have forgotten his own number? No. He'd always been nineteen. He was sitting in the seat marked nineteen. But she had skipped him. He saw the others in his group glance at him, embarrassed, and then avert their eyes quickly. He was worried. He saw a worried look on the face of his group leader. He hunched his shoulders and tried to make himself smaller in the seat. He wanted to disappear, to fade away, not to exist. He didn't dare to turn and find his parents in the crowd. He couldn't bear to see their faces darkened with shame. And Jonas bowed his head and searched th through his mind. What had he done wrong? I guess we'll have to wait till next chapter to find out. But you can just imagine what Jonas is going through right now. All that apprehensive, he was so apprehensive building up to this ceremony and then this happens on top of it. So you can just imagine he must be just so nervous and he doesn't understand what's happening. So we'll find out next chapter. Thank you. Okay, so the summary for chapter seven, you'll see it on the slide. I've got some, uh, I've got four points there. So you, I'm just going to read them to you. Um, so it's finally time for the ceremony of 12. Jonas and his friends line up in order of the numbers they were given at birth before they all had names. The numbers reflect the order in which the children are born. Jonas is number 19, which means he's on the older side of this group of children. The assignments are given out, and Asher is number 4. He gets the assignment that is appropriate for him, Director of Recreation. The Chief Elder makes some funny comments about Asher as a child and his, as, um, his lack of precision of language, which is very important in this community. Uh, when the chief elder gets to Fiona, number 18, and standing to Jonah's left, she assigns caretaker of the old, which everyone finds appropriate because of her nature. She's very sensitive. She's very calm. And, they, and she spent a lot of time there. And, and even Jonas thinks, yes, that's a great assignment for her. The chief elder then moves on to number 20. She skips Jonas. Everyone notices, and the crowd is all hushed. The chief elder keeps on right on rolling through all the kids, and Jonas wonders what he might have done wrong. So then we have to wait till chapter 8 to find out what happened. Okay, so here we are in chapter 8, and as you remember, at the end of chapter 7, uh, Jonas hadn't been called, he'd been skipped, and he was really wondering what was happening and what he'd done wrong, so we're going to find out now what happened. Ready? Okay, chapter 8. The audience was clearly ill at ease. They applauded at the final assignment, but the applause was piecemeal, no longer a crescendo of united enthusiasm. There were murmurs of confusion. Jonas moved his hands together, clapping, but it was an automatic, meaningless gesture that he wasn't even aware of. His mind had shut out all earlier emotions, the anticipation, excitement, pride, and even the happy kinship with his friends. Now he felt only humili humiliation, sorry, humiliation and terror. The chief elder waited until the uneasy applause subsided. Then she spoke again. 
I know, she said in her vibrant, gracious voice, that you are all concerned, that you feel that I have made a mistake. She smiled. The community, relieved from its discomfort very slightly by her benign statement, seemed to breathe more easily. It was very silent. Jonas looked up. I have caused you anxiety, she said. I apologize to my community. Her voice flowed over the assembled crowd. We accept your apology, they all uttered together. Jonas, she said, looking down at him, I apologize to you in particular. I caused you anguish. I accept your apology, Jonas replied shakily. Please come to the stage now. Earlier that day, dressing in his own dwelling, he had practiced the kind of jaunty, self-assured walk that he hoped he would make to the stage when he tur his turn came. All of that was forgotten now. He simply willed himself to stand, to move his feet that felt weighted and clumsy, to go forward up the steps and across the platform until he stood at her side. Reassuringly, she placed her arms across his shoulder, her arm across his shul tense shoulders. Jonas had not been assigned, she has not been assigned, she informed the crowd as his heart sank. Then she went on, Jonas has been selected. He blinked. What did that mean? He felt a collective questioning stir from the audience. They too were puzzled. In a firm commanding voice, she announced, Jonas has been selected to be our next receiver of memory. Then he heard the gasp, the sudden intake of breath drawn sharply in astonishment by each of the seated citizens. He saw their faces, their eyes widen in awe, and still he did not understand. Such a selection is very, very rare, the chief elder told the audience. Our community has only one receiver. It is he who trains his successor. We have had our current receiver for a very long time, she went on. Jonas followed her eyes and saw that she was looking at one of the elders. The committee of elders was sitting together in a group, and the chief elder's eyes were now on the one who sat in the midst, but seemed oddly separate from them. It was a man Jonas had never noticed before, a bearded man with pale eyes. He was watching Jonas intently. If you remember, too, Jonas also has pale eyes, so there could be a connection there. We failed in our last selection, the chief elder said solemnly. It was ten years ago when Jonas was a toddler. I will not dwell on the experience because it causes us terrible discomfort. Jonas didn't know what she was referring to, but he could see, sense the discomfort of the audience. They shifted uneasily in their seats. We have not been hasty this time, she continued. We cannot afford another failure. Sometimes, she went on, speaking now in a lighter torn, tone, relaxing the tension in the auditorium, we are not entirely certain about the assignments, even after the most painstaking observations. Sometimes we worry the ones assigned might not develop through training, every attribute necessary. Elevens are still children, after all. What we observe as playfulness and patience, the requirements to become nurturers, could, with maturity, be revealed as simply foolishness and indolence. So we continue to observe during training and to modify behavior when necessary. But the receiver and trainer cannot be observed, cannot be modified. That is stated quite clearly in the rules. He is to be alone, apart, while he is being prepared by the current receiver for the job, which is the most honored in our community. Alone? Apart? Jonas listened with increasing unease. Therefore, the selection must be sound. It must be a unanimous choice of the committee. They can have no doubts, however fleeting. If during the process an elder reports a dream of uncertainty, that dream has the power to set a candidate aside instantly. Jonas was identified as possible receiver many years ago. We have observed him meticulously. There were no dreams of uncertainty. He has shown all of the qualities that a receiver must have. With her hand still firmly on his shoulder, the chief elder listed the qualities. Intelligent, she said. We are all aware that Jonas has been a top student throughout his school days. Integrity, she said next. Jonas has, like all of us, committed minor transgressions. She smiled at him. We expect that. We hoped, also, that he would present himself promptly for chastisement, and he has always done so. Courage, she went on. Only one of us here today has ever undergone the rigorous training required of a receiver. He, of course, is the most important member of the committee, the current receiver. It, has, it was he who reminded us again and again of the courage required. Jonas, she said, turning to him, but speaking in a voice that the entire community could hear, the training required of you involves pain, physical pain. He felt a flutter within him. You have never experienced that. Yes, you have scraped your knees and falls from your bicycle. Yes, you crushed your finger in a door last year. Jonas nodded, agreeing, as he recalled the incident and, it was, and his accompanying misery. But you will now be faced with she explained, with a pain of magnitude that none of us here can comprehend because it is beyond our experience. 
The receiver himself was not able to describe it, only to remind us that you would have to be faced with it, that you would need immense courage. We cannot prepare you for that. But we feel certain that you are brave, she said to him. Well, he did not feel brave at all. Not now. The fourth essential attribute, the chief elder said, is wisdom. Jonas has not yet acquired that. The acquisition of wisdom will come through his training. We are convinced that Jonas has the ability to acquire wisdom. That is what we are looked for. And finally, the receiver must have one more quality, and it is one that I can only name but not describe. I do not understand it. You, members of the community, will not understand it either. Perhaps Jonas will, because the current receiver has told us that Jonas already has this quality. He calls it the capacity to see beyond. The chief elder looked at Jonas with a question in her eyes, and the audience watched him too. They were silent, and for a moment he froze, consumed with despair. He didn't have it, though whatever she had said, he didn't know what it was. And now was the moment when he would have to confess to say, no, no, I don't, I can't, and throw himself on their mercy and ask their forgiveness to explain that he had been wrongly chosen, that he was not the right one after all. But when he looked out across the crowd, the sea of faces, the thing happened again. The thing that had happened with the apple. They changed. He blinked, and it was gone. And his shoulders straightened slightly. Briefly, he felt a tiny sliver of sureness for the first time. She was still watching him. They all were. I think it's true, he told the chief elder and the community. I don't understand it yet. I don't know what it is. But sometimes I see something. And maybe it's beyond. She, shook, she took her arm from his shoulder. Jonas, she said, speaking not to him alone, but to the entire community of which he was a part. You will be trained to be our next receiver of memory. You thank, we thank you for your childhood. Then she turned and left the stage and left him alone, standing and facing the crowd, which began spontaneously the collective murmur of his name, Jonas. It was a whisper at first, hushed, barely audible, Jonas. Then louder, faster, Jonas, Jonas, Jonas. With the chant, Jonas knew the community was accepting him and his new role, giving him life the way they had given it to the new child, Caleb. His heart swelled with gratitude and pride, but at the same time, he was filled with fear. He did not know what the selection meant. He did not know what he was to become or what would become of him. So that was a very exciting chapter. The anticipation is finally over, but I think he still is apprehensive about what is going to be coming, what is going to be involved in this new role that he has in the community. Thanks for listening. Okay, so that was the end of chapter eight, and now the chapter eight summary. So again, I'm going to read it to you. Finally, when all the twelves have gotten their assignments, the elder addresses the fact that she skipped Jonas. She apologizes, and everyone ritualistically chants, we accept your apology, including Jonas when she she actually points to him and says, I'm really sorry for your discomfort. He says, I accept your apology, which is really just shows. I mean, he really, I mean, he's, he's still apprehensive, and, but he knows he has to answer that. She goes on to say what Joan, that Jonas has not been assigned, rather that he's been selected. Jonas is selected to be the receiver of memories. Everyone in the crowd is surprised because this is a great honor. The chief elder explains that they tried to pick a new receiver about 10 years ago, but it failed. This is clearly an uncomfortable topic for everyone, so she quickly moves on. And Jonas can, you can see Jonas is uncomfortable with it, thinking what happened. He doesn't know. Then she starts listing all of Jonas's qualities that qualify him to be the receiver, intelligence, integrity, courage. Um, she says they're gonna, there's going to be pain, but she doesn't go into details about that. Wisdom, there's one more quality, she says, the capacity to see beyond. He doesn't know what that means, but he's going to soon find out. And at the end of the chapter, you see it actually happens. And he says, oh, I think I do have that. I know I'm a little bit different. I see things that, are, that change. And so that's kind of interesting. The crowd chants his name, and Jonas is both proud and fearful of what is to come. And you see the list also with intelligence, integrity, courage. Um, these can be uh, characteristics that you could use in a character analysis essay if you're talking about Jonas, right? So think about all those, those characteristics that made him the receiver of intelligence. Those are qualities that you'll be able to find quotes for, and you'll be able to elaborate in a character analysis essay. Because in an, in an essay generally like that, you would choose three adjectives that describe your character. So that would be a really good place to go back to uh, for um, for quotes, for example, even if you wanted to start, you know, talking about it, it would be a great place to start. So um, that's all. That's all for now. On to chapter nine.